Welcome to another project here on Building Wisconsin. I'm Stuart Keith and on today's show, well, we're visiting the new elementary school in Sauk Prairie. So let's get started with Superintendent Cliff Thompson. Well, Cliff, at first glance, this is coming along nicely. This is a beautiful new school here in Sauk Prairie. It is absolutely beautiful. We're so proud of it and so thankful that our community has embraced the vision of building a facility like this for our kids. Well, you know, that's why we wanted to have you on today's show. We're gonna get into some of the construction aspect, but I was more curious about the design process and actually how you even get to this stage. I mean, how does a community know when they need a new school? Well, that is such a great question because strategic planning is a part of every school district. So you look at your facilities and how they age, and then you determine, are they meeting the needs of today's learners? So we decided to engage in this conversation for approximately about the last two and a half years. Okay, so as we're looking at this, what exactly are we looking at? What grades are gonna be in here? Oh, thanks for asking. We're so excited. This is gonna be our youngest learners. So this is gonna be four-year-old kindergarten to second grade. And when we open in the fall, we're gonna have approximately 530 students here. Wow. And so this is really an elementary school, and I'm familiar with the elementary school that's currently here. It's quite a bit smaller than this. It's amazing to think that this kind of space is going to be available to those young learners we're talking about. It's going to be perfect to encourage the type of conversation that really brings them into learning today. And here's what's really exciting, preparing for learning tomorrow. Sure. And have you found that the community has really embraced this project? I mean, it's one thing to look to the future and say, yeah, we need it. But so oftentimes in communities, we see that they always want to put it off to the next generation. Oh, this will be good for now. But you guys have taken that next step and are actually constructing it. And what has been the response? Well, the response has been fantastic. And it started with when we decided to have a referendum conversation, we had 60 small group conversations where we invited people to ask us questions. And through those questions created greater interest and then greater interest brought the conversation, do we really need this or do we have what we need? And the community said, we're going to grow Therefore, we will build and bring these type of facilities to our children of today. Well, you guys must have done a great job educating the constituents to realize the need and how important that need is to, you know, really it's our next generation of kids. And why not start early on, you know, to get them to the high school level and beyond. And I love the way you frame that because that's it, a commitment to today while looking forward to tomorrow. And the Sauk Prairie community has embraced its schools. When I think about people that are working on site that have attended our schools in our school district, we love them for the work they do both in the trades here as well as the community and outside the community. Our graduates go on to be very successful in all walks of life. Well, you must have put together quite a staff to help even in the initial stages, not to mention the design and construction aspect. Well, our administrative team, uh, Jeff Wright, Judy Weinstock, Doug Yost came together to be the teachers of this. We really believe that our people, when they go with the tours and our children walk in the doors, they're going to say, this is fantastic. This is everything we hope for. We thank our partners from Kramer Brothers. We thank our partners from Plunkett and Racious and all the trades people that have invested. Over 100 people are on site right now today doing this great work. We're so proud of them and so proud of their work. Well, it's gonna be a great asset to the community. Thanks a lot for coming on. I'm gonna go catch up with Jeff and Judy. Sounds fantastic, thank you so much. Well, Jeff, looks like it's coming to fruition. The new school is nearing completion. Yes, it is. We're in a classroom here for two teachers that will work with two different groups of students to be able to share the space. Wow, you know, I look at this. This is quite a bit larger. Yes, uh, they're larger classrooms with a lot more natural light. Sure, this is great. 
Let's begin by explaining what your role in this whole construction process is. I'm the assistant superintendent here in the district, and I was involved in the initial conversations about planning, meeting with teachers and with parents to try to develop a space that would be different than what we're used to seeing in a traditional school. Sure, well I know the previous school is quite a bit smaller than the smaller classrooms. This classroom looks huge, it's awesome, it's gonna be a great learning environment. But let's step back before we get to the learning environment itself. How do you start designing a school? We visited many other schools in the state and tried to find schools that were challenging the way schools have been built in the past. And we're fortunate to visit some of those unique places. And then we sat down with teachers and with parents and said, how do you want your student to learn? And where do you want your student to learn? And then worked with a great team of architects that said, we can make this work. It's not gonna be what you're used to, but we're gonna make a great space. Wow, so it really seems like an open door process. You're open to ideas, really challenging the whole thought process of a school. What is it? It's a learning environment, sure, but it's a modern and futuristic learning environment. And we want that learning environment to support the instruction we want to see, as opposed to being a, a, a hindrance to that type of instruction. Many schools make it very difficult for teachers to teach the way they want to teach because of the traditional setup. We want to make sure that when students need assistance, that the assistance can come to the student instead of sending them down the hall to an old closet or a vestibule doorway. Sure. But instead we bring that support to the students, which is why we put the breakout spaces outside of all these classrooms with windows so that the teachers can look out and see their students working in small groups or with maybe an English language learner teacher support or a special education teacher, but bringing those supports to the student environment instead of sending the students away from their environment. Definitely thinking outside the box when it comes to learning. The community should be excited as they are. And we are excited and too. what a great learning environment for the next generation. I wish we could spend the whole show on the design process. Right now I gotta catch up with Judy to that learn more great. about the construction elements going into this project. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Boy, I just love all the vibrant colors you guys are incorporating into this plan. I, I can't help but believe all the young kids are just going to gravitate to it. And it'll be a much nicer, more enjoyable learning environment. Yes, when we looked at this, we wanted it functional, but we wanted it welcoming. And um, I think with the colors, we've done a lot of that. And you know, talking to Jeff, learning a little bit about the design philosophies that went into it, that was great. Now we want to have you on because we want to learn more about the construction aspects per se and how you take a plan and implement it and eventually get to reality and have it constructed. So let's go back. A year ago in April, on April 1st, uh, 2014, we had a referendum question that passed. Literally next day we were meeting with the architects and developed a plan. Started construction a few months later in the fall so we could actually get underway and students moved in September 2015. That just blows my mind. So you're saying last fall, so like eight months ago, this project started, the construction aspect of it, and you're going to be done within a year so that this coming fall, the students of Sauk Prairie are going to be in their new facility. Yes. That is the ultimate in fast track construction. How are you able to do that? We were worried about that, and both our, our architect consultants and our contractor said it is doable, and so they brought in enough people to make it happen, and wow. it is happening. And that's great news for the community as a whole. Now, what exactly is your role in this whole process? My role is I've been a point person with coordinating between the contractor, their progress meetings, our buildings and grounds guys, and the architects, so as different things come up, there's basically one place to go, and that's through my office. Fair to say you're almost like the watchdog of it. You're, you're looking at the plan you have and uh, intimate understanding of it. You're coming out on site as the building gets built, constructed, and you're making sure the taxpayers are getting what they are ultimately paying for? Absolutely, because we want to open it. We want it to be functional. We want it to be beautiful, and we want people to be happy with it. Sure, that's great for them to know it's really going to be something the community as a whole can be proud of, and of course, everybody involved in it can be proud of the end result. I appreciate you coming on. Give us a little bit of insight. Well, thanks for being here. Do come back when it's completed.
Well, Justin, this school is just coming along awesome. It's going to be beautiful for the community of Sauk Prairie. And so far in today's show, we've learned about some of the design objectives and some of the general construction, but we want to focus in on the plumbing now and some of the aspects of plumbing that go into a project of this magnitude. So let's begin by explaining what your role is here. Well, I am the uh, project manager uh, for the plumbing on this project. I am the division manager at h, h Industries for plumbing. On this project, it's really kind of special for me because this is my hometown. I went to school here, my kids go to school here. It's kind of special to be able to kind of give back to the community, kind of uh, ensure that they are receiving a, you know, a quality project done on time. That's huge. I'm sure that you take great pride in all the structures that you, you project manage, but I got to believe one in your backyard here is near and dear to your heart. It's going to be done right, that's for sure. That's exactly right. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, you know, a lot of people don't realize that plumbers are really the first trade or one of the first trades on the job, and they're one of the last trades on the job because you've got a lot of underground to do, and then you've got to hang the fixtures at the end. So what we'd like to do today is follow along some of the different plumbing aspects that are at this stage of the construction and tell us what it's going to take to finish it up. Okay, sounds good. Let's go take a look. Okay. Wow, Justin, lots of construction activity going on in all the trades, and you've taken us into, it looks like, the main mechanical room. What are the different plumbing aspects that you're in charge of? Well, in this mechanical room, obviously you see over here, we've got the heating hot water, the boilers. Over in the corner, we've got the water heaters and the water softeners. And that basically feeds the domestic hot water throughout the building. Okay, and then I also noticed some sprinklers, but the plumbers aren't necessarily installing the boilers, the sprinklers. What is your role that you guys are doing? We're primarily doing the domestic hot water, domestic cold water, as you can see over there. Ryan's working on the water heater piping, braid is in the line in there. Well, you know, when I look at this, you said this is the main mechanical room. I only see two water heaters. Is that all that is needed for a school this size? Well, those are two 399,000 BTU water heaters. So there are plenty of uh, capacity to meet the demand of the school. Uh, primarily on a school like this, an elementary school, you don't have a lot of demand for hot water. There's not a lot of shower rooms. There's not a sure. huge kitchen, so. Not like if it were a high school or something where you have a lot of athletics and shower rooms going Correct. on. Correct, yep. Okay, so that's still 800,000 BTUs. That's a heck of a lot of uh, hot water, that's for sure. What are the two tanks up front? Those are the water softeners. The soft water actually feeds the hot water system, so all the hot water is soft. And uh, you need that, of course, for longevity in your equipment and your fixtures throughout the building. Sure. And a lot of people might not realize down here in southern Wisconsin, we have a lot of hard water. It so is it's very important. hard water, yes. Yeah. Okay, now did you say he was actually brazing? I thought he was soldering back there. Why would they be brazing that? Well, what he's doing there, it's actually called a T-drill. And it's a pulled T off that line, and it's a brazed joint, which is much stronger. It actually has more tensile strength than an actual T, so it's quicker. Our guys are trained to do that type of work. Well, again, I always marvel at the training that goes in to know how to do that. And one thing I've learned is the industry continues to evolve, but the training evolves along with it. Certainly. We've got some very highly trained individuals on this job. We've got a great crew through our local union training. These guys go through five-year apprenticeships. They, they learn all about soldering, brazing, all the different aspects of installing plumbing. Sure, not to mention all the new products and keeping up with those. So they're installed correctly, and at the end of the day, we're talking getting the best value for the constituents. Okay, so here's the main mechanical room. Where does it all get fed out of here? This all goes down to the, the first floor, and it gets dispersed through the building. We've got hot water, cold water, and hot water return mains that go out throughout the wings, and that gets all circulated through the building and feeds all the fixtures, the kitchen, the bathrooms, etc. Well, let's go take a look at some of that if we can. Sounds good. Wow, as we walk into this room, it gives a good idea of all the different trades in action. I see the HVAC, I see the sprinkler fitters. Looks like your handiwork up here. It's really tight quarters you're working in. It is. What we've got up here is uh, our domestic waters. We've got hot, cold, and hot return. That feeds the bathroom group over here. Up above our heads here, you've got the sanitary sewer, all the cast iron pipe. That feeds the bathroom group above. 
Behind me here, we've got the secondary roof drainage. It's the storm sewer, and over in the corner back there is the primary storm. And a lot of people don't realize that we as plumbers have to take the water off the roof and oh, get it sure, away from the building. Oh, sure, because if you have a, a flat roof building, it's not totally flat, but the water has to go somewhere because it, it probably accumulates an awful lot in, say, a half-inch rainstorm. you got a lot of water coming down. Certainly, yeah, it all has to go. And, you know, I look up here, I see it's a concrete structure. Does that make it more challenging for you guys to work? It does. You have to uh, make sure you get your layouts correct the first time. It costs quite a bit of money to go and correct things after the fact. So Sure. Are you guys using that BIM 3D modeling on this project? We did. On this project, we spent several weeks actually modeling this whole building with all the mechanical trades, electrical, plumbing, fire protection, so everything would fit. And you know what I've seen in the past, too, is if you do, in the unlikely event that you do have to make a change, once you make it, all the other trades know that you're making that change. Right, everybody knows, and so there's no surprises. Well, you mentioned the supply lines. I assume those are feeding the fixtures. Are you at the stage yet where you're setting them? We are. Wings C and D, we're setting fixtures up there. Right after that, we'll be setting fixtures in A and B here, so it's coming together. Boy, how many plumbers do you have on this project? We started out with seven plumbers on the underground. Right now, actually, we're down to four, and probably in two or three weeks, we'll be down to three. That just blows my mind. It doesn't sound like very many plumbers. This is a huge school. I mean, it's an elementary school, but it is very large, and seven plumbers all the way down to three can complete this? Well, we've got highly trained individuals. We've got great crews. These guys know what they're doing, and it's a new era, so everyone's got to be highly trained, highly efficient. And you mentioned the BIM coordination before, and that's all part of it. Everything's streamlined nowadays. Wow. I mean, if I live in this community, I'm happy to hear that. And I think anybody looking to build a new school within their district, that's the type of construction workers, tradespeople, they need working on projects. Because ultimately, we're talking value. It's tax dollars going into these buildings. We want the best possible value with the structures lasting as long as they possibly can. And you guys are doing a great job. Are you going to finish on time? We will. We're right on schedule. Well, that's great. I really appreciate you coming on today's show and giving us a behind-the-scenes look at the plumbing in this structure. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Prevailing Wage, in its early onset, the idea was is to make sure that people who lived in the community actually got to do the work to build their own communities. And the best way to do that is find out what people make in those communities. And then when the public's going to spend dollars to put people to work there, pay the rate of what someone paid to put it in their house or a gas station or a restaurant. That construction worker should make the same pay as what's happened in the private sector. It ensures reinvestment in communities and people living, working, and playing in their community. Building Wisconsin is made possible by the members of Plumbers 75, proudly serving their contractors and helping build Wisconsin for over 100 years. We all know the most basic form of life requires clean water to survive. On Earth, we need it to drink, cook, clean, and it touches just about every part of our quality of life. Here in Wisconsin, we appreciate the value of clean water even more as we live alongside the Great Lakes. Yet we often forget to think about how water gets to our homes, schools, and businesses, and then safely back to Mother Nature. Where does all the dirty water go? How is it fresh and clean every time we get a glass of water? Who makes this happen? The answer, plumbers. It's the plumbers who are trained, mentored on the job, and have progressed through a five-year education program that takes them from apprenticeship to a master of their trade. It's plumbers who are committed to a career and have been trained to protect the health and safety of our water system and make sure you never have to think about where it comes from and where it's going. Yes, we're fortunate here in Wisconsin to have an abundant supply of clean, fresh water but even more fortunate to have a highly trained and committed workforce to keep and deliver it that way. Plumbers 75, supporting the plumbing trade in Southeast Wisconsin for over 100 years. H&H &H Industries is a world-class mechanical contractor serving customers all across Wisconsin and the Midwest. H&H &H specializes in plumbing, heating, and air conditioning systems for commercial, industrial, and residential applications. 
And with an on-site manufacturing facility for prefabrication and an industry-leading design team using the latest software, H&H can ensure that every possible cost savings measure is considered before a project is even started. H&H Industries and Plumbers 75, proud to be building Wisconsin. For more information on Building Wisconsin, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and be sure to watch additional episodes on YouTube or at our website, buildingwisconsintv.com. Welcome back to our project here on Building Wisconsin. I'm Stuart Keith. And so far in today's show, we've been following along the construction process at the new elementary school here in Sauk Prairie. Now let's continue with Paul Christensen from H&H &H Industries. So what Randy's working on here is a piping takeoff in a mechanical room. You can see pipes and uh, hangers and everything. This is a flat view. We submit that in and then you'll watch Randy's going to rotate that. Oh, now wow. we've brought the ISO out of that and now we've got an elevation view. Yeah, and you can see all the hangers and everything in there. This is awesome. And you know, when I see technology like this, I think back not too many years ago, how were we able to build quality structures, you know, in the type timeline? And apparently this is what has led to the efficiencies that we see now in the industries. For example, up at Sauk, I mean, that tight timeline. Yep. And what I really wanted to have you on today's show is to address those efficiencies from a business owner perspective. And that's exactly what these guys are doing. With this software, we're able to give a much more accurate bid, which is a, a savings to the owner or the client, because now we're truly only counting the offsets and the hangers that are truly needed because we have that ISO view to do so. Sure, it's an accurate bid. I equate that to very good value for yep. the end user and a lot of these public projects like a school that's to the taxpayer so it's great to see technology in use so is it fair to say any of your projects begin in this room this is where it begins this is our war room and this is where it begins for every one of our projects okay so what are the guys up to so randy's our chief estimator randy focuses on our piping takeoff kale he focuses on our sheet metal takeoff and then the guy at the end there is Andy, he focuses on our plumbing takeoff. And those three guys put all three disciplines together for a complete project bid then. Just out of curiosity, how long does it take to create a bid for a different project? Every project ranges. Uh, if you look at the SOC school, SOC school is about a week time period. Wow, in a week. So the timeline for construction is tight, but the bidding was very tight as well. Yes. Yep. Okay, so once they establish the bid, they get the drawings done, where does it go from here? So from this, these guys have started the CAD process by the software allowing us to get that ISO view with elevation, but then it gets finalized. We're gonna go down to our CAD department next, and I'll show you what they do from here now. Hey, I recognize this. Isn't that the Sauk Prairie School we visited? That is exactly what it is. Right here is the front entryway where we walked in the other day. Okay, so you said upstairs, all the drawings and bidding's done. This is the next step in the process? Yep, so the information from our estimating department gets sent down here to our CAD and BIM department. And then these gentlemen work on making sure that there's no conflicts or collisions in the field amongst the trades. You know, out there with Justin at the school, he was just raving about this technology. He used the term BIM, and he said it really helps efficiencies in the construction process. Absolutely, and if you didn't have this technology, these guys would be figuring that out on the job site with concrete structures in place and stuff. It is not cheap to move concrete structures or big pipes on a computer here. They can do it at the click of a button, fix an issue. And you know, when we look at all the technology nowadays, do you find that the demand on the plumbers in the field is higher than it's ever been? Absolutely. What well, these plumbers need to know how to do today, it, it's not just joining pipes anymore. These guys have all kinds of math, trigonometry, geometry they're doing. They have to be able to read these 3D virtual prints that we send them on tablets and computers. And so, yes, it's a very high demanding industry and they got to know a lot. Well, Stu, I'm showing you our computer software and the technology side of things. Now I'm bringing you out to one of our fabrication shops. This is one of our three fabrication shops. This is huge. I mean, there's a lot of investment in infrastructure in this shop alone. Yes, there is. There's a lot of money invested in this equipment here, but we also have a big investment in our people out in the field as well. 
We have to have people to know how to work on this equipment still yet and use it and then use the pieces that we ship out to them. You know, and I look around here and you have professionals that you've hired to work in the shop. You have professionals out on site. From a business owner perspective, how important are those individuals? I mean, you've invested a lot in the equipment, but to me, you can have the best equipment in the world, but you need somebody highly trained, highly skilled to operate it correctly. Absolutely. If they don't operate this equipment properly, uh, they're, they're going to break the equipment or injure themselves. So we have to have skilled tradesmen. You know, I can speak from my own heart here, Stu. I'm a business owner now, but I've been a steam fitter for 15 years. So I've been a, I've been a skilled tradesman longer than I've been a business owner. And I've lived and breathed what we do in the field every day, the dangers we face, but then also the knowledge it takes to be able to do our job. We're doing trigonometry, geometry, algebra, science, all kinds of work all day, every day. What do you say when somebody says to you, can't you find somebody to do the same job that that plumber's doing for a little less money? Well, we're building cheaper by fabricating, but if I could find somebody to do the same job, absolutely, but it doesn't exist, Stu. In order to get the efficiency and qualities that we have and that the state of Wisconsin wants and is demanded from us, we have to have a, a good wage for those people. And really what that comes back to, in my opinion, is quality of life. I mean, we talk about our roads, our bridges, our infrastructure, our public buildings. We want them to be built to the highest quality that we can. And that's because of the people doing it. Yep. And so it, it rubs me the wrong way when I hear people say, well, let's get somebody else from out of state to build it cheaper. I think we should hire the people right here in Wisconsin that are highly skilled, highly trained to do the jobs right. It's a very professional industry too. I mean, our guys go through a five-year apprenticeship program. That, that's longer than most people go to college to get a degree. You know, so our guys are going through this five-year apprenticeship program before they're even able to just go out on their own and do a task as a journeyman. Sure, well, I'm, we're fortunate to have the workforce here, business owners like yourself. I appreciate you coming on and giving us a brief overview of H&H &H Industries. I appreciate it, Stu, this has been great. The preceding program was sponsored by the Building Wisconsin Television Network.